Good afternoon, everybody. Wearing a tie today from Franciscan University, our friends in Steubenville. I want to start uh, with the budget. As we all know, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic has had a profound impact on the American economy. It certainly has had a profound impact on the Ohio economy as well. Uh, Prior to the onset of the Cronus pandemic, Ohio's economy was strong and our budget was on track. For example, by the end of February, state revenues for the fiscal year up until that point were ahead of estimates by over $200 million. That was at the end of February for the year. Uh, we now have figures in for the month of April. Um, our fiscal year-to-date revenues have taken, as you can imagine, a rather dramatic turn uh, in just in two months. We are now below the budget estimates for the year by $776.9 million. So as you can see, that is a turnaround um, going the wrong way of a close to a uh, billion dollars. Uh, just to put this in perspective, a billion dollars per month is what the state pays uh, and spends on primary and secondary education as well as to our state colleges and universities each month. That's each month. Our Office of Budget Management Director Kim Mernix and her team are projecting that state revenues will continue to be below budget in the coming months as we move through this crisis. Uh, nationwide economic forecasts have, of course, been very unpredictable. Um, the forecasts, uh, as well as OBM's projections, indicate to me uh, that we need to make significant changes to our state budget to prepare for the coming months. As I have said, this is certainly no ordinary time, and we cannot continue onward as, this was, as if this was a, a normal period of time. In Ohio, we, of course, have a two-year budget cycle. Uh, each fiscal year runs from June 1st, excuse me, July 1st to June 30th, and we are now starting the 11th month of our 24-month budget cycle. The budget has to be balanced throughout that entire period of time, and it has to be balanced within each, by the end of each of those separate years. Unlike the federal government, uh, we have to balance our budget, and we intend to do so. So today I am announcing a $775 million budget reduction in general revenue fund spending for the remainder for the remainder of 2020 that means that we have to obtain these 775 million dollars in cuts in the next 2 months decisions like this are certainly very difficult and unpleasant but they are part of my responsibility as your governor to make while we do not know what the coming months will hold, uh, we do know that COVID-19 is here with us and will be here with us for a while. Uh, that does not exempt us uh, from the obligation to balance our budget. Making difficult budget decisions now will help us down the road, and it will help us while we continue our discuss discussions for the next fiscal year budget. Um, let me explain a little bit about that. I have decided to not draw down the money from the rainy day fund for the next two months. We have decided to make cuts, uh, which will enable us to balance the budget for the next two months. And I'll explain this in more detail in a moment. 
but simply stated, we are going to need that money, that rainy day fund, uh, for next year uh, and possibly for the year after. The cruel nature of an economic downturn uh, is that at the time when you're in need of a social safety net, it's also the time when government revenues shrink. Uh, we're trying to preserve basic services for people while we get through this period. And one of the things that we're going to try to achieve uh, is some stability. Let me again return to the rainy day fund, because I know we've received a lot of questions. Are you going to pull down the rainy day fund? And the answer is yes, we will. We're just not going to do it in the next two months. Uh, I know that I have said that it's raining, uh, but we really do not want to tap into that fund yet. Uh, this rain uh, is not a passing spring shower. Uh, it could be, we don't really know, but could be a long, cold, lingering storm. Uh, and we should not use that rainy day funding until we have to. None of these decisions are easy, and I do not make them lightly, uh, but they are necessary. As many of our businesses and our citizens of the state of Ohio are having to make difficult decisions, it is incumbent upon us in government to make those same decisions. I want to outline uh, briefly where these cuts will be made. And again, these are cuts that we will be making for the next two months. We will reduce Medicaid spending by $210 million. K-12 foundation payment reduction will be $300 million. Other education budget line items, $55 million. Higher education, $110 million. All other agencies, $100 million. And that totals up to $775 million. If the money in the budget, that is Ohio taxpayers' money, only 9.4% only 9.4% is spent on operating expenses of state agencies. Over 85% goes out across the state as subsidies to schools, higher education, Medicaid services, local government, et cetera. So most of the budget uh, does not get spent on state agencies, but are really transfer payments that go out to our local communities and to our local schools throughout the state of Ohio. Any cut to education is difficult, but we have an obligation to do our best to balance these cuts and to protect the most vulnerable of our students. And we intend to do that with these cuts. Further, while no one can predict future revenues or exactly where our economy is going, we need to do everything that we can to try to ensure stability and funding for our schools and some predictability as much as possible. We have an obligation to our schools, to our students, to our parents, to give them as much predictability as we can. And so if we do not make these cuts now, over the next two months, the cuts we will have to make next year would have to be more dramatic. Now, with regard to our state agencies, each of our agencies, with the exception of the Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, is taking cuts, including the governor's office. Regarding our state agencies, on March 23rd, I initiated an immediate hiring freeze for state employees and state agencies, boards, and commissions. That continues. I also ordered a freeze on pay increases and promotions of unclassified and exempt staff and a freeze on new contract uh, series for the state. That continues. I've asked each agency director to continue to identify additional savings in their budgets for the remainder of this fiscal year and for next fiscal year. Moving forward. All state agencies will continue in the hiring freeze as well as the freeze on pay increases and promotions. 
State agencies will continue to operate under the travel freeze already in effect, with exceptions for those staff providing direct services in regard to this emergency. Further agencies will immediately freeze new requests for contract services, except for those services that are necessary for emergency response, and will strictly scrutinize the continued need for those services. Agencies will suspend purchasing authority for non-essential purchases with continuation of only mission-critical contractual services. Those are the decisions uh, that we are making for the next two months. Uh, we have been in, in contact uh, with the legislature uh, about these. Uh, I bear the responsibility. Uh, we will continue uh, to discuss with the legislature where we will go with next year's budget. Uh, which will be immediately uh, uh, upon us. And I look forward to uh, consultation with the minority leadership as well as the majority leadership of both the House and the Senate. Let me turn now to uh, the Attorney Lieutenant Governor, John Houston. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to just expand a little bit on some of the things that the Governor just announced. Um, you know, it has been my privilege to serve um, in public office in both the legislature and the executive branch. And, and so I've had a chance to go through difficult budget decisions over time. We went through them after 9-11. Uh, we went through them after uh, the Great Recession. Uh, and now we're in the midst of the global pandemic that coronavirus has created and there are both health and economic consequences as well as budgetary consequences. Uh, in all of those times, I can never recall a period where we went in basically a two-month period to having a billion-dollar swing, from having more revenue than we had estimated uh, to having far less revenue, Seven, $200 million overage to a, to a $779 million shortfall. Uh, that is the most dramatic swing I can ever recall. Um, we don't know how long it's going to last. The economic consequences, the budgetary consequences should, could be shorter, could be longer. But it's prudent, as the governor mentioned, to plan for the long haul. In the end, this is about providing as much stability to the people out there, because that's where most state government go goes, where state government money goes, is outside of state government. It goes to schools, it goes to health care providers, and I'm going to touch on that in just a minute, but we have to, we have to plan for that future. And uh, Eric, if you could put up the, the, um, the blue slide or the pie chart there. Um, this, I think, really gets at the heart of it. If you look at the, the, three pie ch the, the three pieces of the pie, the gray is essentially debt service. And that's what we pay out of the state budget for debt service. The green is what you would call administration. That's all of the elected officials and and the courts and everything that it takes, legal, administrative, all of that to administer state government. It's, it's not a huge part of the pie. The blue is everything else. That's the money that goes out the door for Medicaid providers, it goes out for K through 12, goes out for higher education and for local government. And that's the challenge that we have. That's why when you see money that gets cut from, from the things that we dread cutting them from, schools, uh, Medicaid providers uh, and the like, it's because that's the state has to balance its budget and that's where all the money is. Every, uh, the green piece of the pie and the blue piece of the pie are getting its cuts. Everything else is debt service. And I and, um, just wanted to put that in perspective for folks so that they, they really understand how the state budget works. We balance the budget. Uh, most of the money we have goes out the door to serve other people. And uh, that's the, the nature of how uh, state government operates. I do want to say, do want to say this as well, that, and, and, and I've talked about this for a while, it's a health crisis. A health crisis that in response creates an economic crisis uh, with budget consequences. That's not just at state government, that's for our local government uh, friends in this state. That's for state government. It, it's a federal issue. Uh, it's a global issue. Um, it's not 
This is, this is an economic crisis that's not unique to Ohio. And while we're opening things up in Ohio, that's not going to solve the global economic consequences of what's having, uh, of, what, of what we're facing. That's why it's important when you hear what we've been saying here over the last few weeks about learning to live with coronavirus in our lives, protecting lives and livelihoods, and doing two things at once. Those are kind of the themes that you've, you've heard often because we know that we have to get the economy moving so that people can pay their bills and so that the private economy, which funds, the public, uh, which funds public services, can be as robust as possible. They all fit together. Uh, and we have, to, we have to design a policy. The governor is in charge of designing a policy that meets all of those needs, that, that, that tries to get, uh, put people back to work, that gets the private economy going so that we can fund that social safety net that, that education and children depend on, that health care and people who need health care services depend on. Uh, it is the social safety net um, that is critical to our lives. And so that's why all of this has to come together at once, why it's so difficult um, to piece these pieces uh, together in a way that strikes that balance. And I really believe that we are in a great position because of the early decisions, because of the early warning that, that Dr. Acton provided, because of the quick action that the governor uh, undertook, because of the partnerships that we have with business that is talking about how we can safely return to work, protecting employees and customers, beginning to get the Ohio economy moving so that uh, we can serve uh, everybody that uh, depends on both work and, and uh, public, uh, public services. So uh, I really believe that um, Ohio is poised to do this as well as any state in the country. And uh, you're getting from us at these podiums every day a bit more of what those plans look like. It is moving forward, uh, and, and it will all depend on how we pull together to make sure that we're doing the things in our private lives to keep us healthy, to not spread the coronavirus so that we can get the economy back working, get people back working, and help uh, to, to provide for the services that everybody needs. Thank you. Governor? John, thank you. Dr. Acton. Good afternoon, Governor, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and start with the data. Uh, so today uh, in Ohio, we now have seen a total of 20,969 cases, and that's up about 495 cases from yesterday. Um, unfortunately, our, our, our deaths in Ohio are now at 1,000. 135. Um, that's a change of reporting over the last 24 hours of about 79. Um, we have had deaths in 63 of our 88 counties, and all 88 counties have had cases. Uh, next slide. Again, our testing numbers continuing to inch upward. We've now tested almost 160 thousand in Ohio. That's a little over um, one to one and a half percent of our population. Um, and uh, other than that, I think everything else looks the same. Eric? And again, uh, continuing giving you those times. These are 21-day trends. Um, we do see that our cases uh, did not increase as much as the average. Um, we are up a little bit in our hospitalizations for the day compared to a five-day or a 21-day average. And we'll keep these numbers for you and many other numbers on our website. Next. Again, this is our testing slide, really not a significant change. Uh, we're continuing to inch upward each day, uh, our, our last day being May 4th, and we inched up again over um, up toward the, the um, Five to 6,000 mark, and we'll keep all of that again on our website. Uh, we do look forward uh, to the governor. We've been talking a lot about new data sets that we'll be sharing, and of course, we'll bring that to you uh, later this week. Next slide. Um, I do want to take a moment um, to go kind of along the lines of what the governor uh, uh, and lieutenant governor just said. Uh, there is 
when I look at the health and well-being of Ohioans, I am thinking about each and every one of the 11.7 million of us that from a complete physical, mental, emotional, and even your economic well-being, all of those things are what make us do better or worse. And when we're trying to look at lives and livelihoods, it's because we know that all of these things are impacting us. And so I wanted to share with you a little bit, you know, we know a pandemic kind of reveals all the chinks in our armor, and whether that be an old database that didn't quite work when you thought you'd have a scale to use it, or whether it means our own personal vulnerabilities, we know now that our mental health, you know, a lot of us are really struggling with a lot, and I've spoken to this before. Uh, Kaiser Permanente, their foundation did a study that was just released in the last 24 hours showing an increase of over a thousand percent of people reaching out for help. And so I just wanted to say I had a quick dialogue and exchange with our uh, director of mental health services, Lori Chris. You've met her before and she'll be coming back again to share things with you. But I think it's really important. Um, Susan Borgia, who is the Traumatic Stress Research Program Head for the National Institutes of Mental Health, said she's being kept up late at night because she's worried about you know, our mental health system and it being able to absorb all the stress and the sort of pandemic stress and restlessness we're all feeling. And on our website, again, coronavirus.ohio.gov, Director Chris has put an amazing set of resources. We're not stopping there. We're really working on making sure our systems there are just as robust to help all Ohioans. So you'll hear more from Director Chris in the days to come. But I want us to know, you know, it breaks us down a little bit. We struggle with what we're dealing with when, with our businesses. And it's also often the time that opens us up. It's that, that thin feeling of being torn apart sometimes. And sometimes in those same moments, even those worst moments, and I've seen this over and over in, in my life and at 54, and I have to remind myself, Governor, every day because a day where I lose my temper or feel despair, um, right in there sometimes is just this little tiny pearl of something that I wouldn't have seen. And it helps to have people to talk to when you're feeling that way, and it helps to get new perspective on issues you're trying and problems we're trying to solve. And talking to someone might be that thing that actually helps you make that new innovation or see a new way forward. So I just want to say again, on our website, it's hard to see on this, we have a 1-800 no number 720-9616. Please go to our website. Also on our website, you can text for hope, for the number four hope to 741 741, where there are trained crisis helpers to talk to you as well. Um, we really want to help folks, and we want to help each other. Just please do see, don't give up hope. These are hard times. We know they're going to continue. We are going to be there with you through them. Um, we all need each other right now. Ohio is pulling together from our businesses to our government, to our nonprofits, to our philanthropies, to our neighbors, to each other. You're helping me. I'm helping you. The things we're doing are helping each other. And I really believe Ohioans are digging deep on this, and we have resources to help you. So please, please know they're there. Thank you. Dr. Acton, thank you very much. Questions? Good afternoon, Governor DeWine, Ben Schwartz with WCPO in Cincinnati. Um, Governor, I want to ask you a question that was sent in from a viewer. Um, this viewer's dad has tested positive for COVID-19 and his father works at a small business in Cincinnati where one third of their staff has tested positive as well. He says the employer has taken no steps to provide a safe environment for work, and he's wondering how the state will be able to properly manage non-essential businesses like that while things like this with not enough safety are happening at them, um, while also doing it with um, essential businesses that are already operating. Yeah, Ben, did you say what kind, type of business it was? It's small. Um, when I say a third, I think it's three and nine employees. Um, I, I don't know exactly what type, though. I'm assuming it's a small store. 
Dr. Acton, do you have any thoughts thoughts um, on that? And then I'll Ben, I, I do have some thoughts on that. You know, as I was just ending my last lines, I was thinking about how exciting it has been to work with businesses and help them. You know, you're really racking your brain and then you find that aha moment. And I wonder if both the employees and the businesses out there aren't armed with enough information to help them make those decisions. And again, we're still reeling, we're still putting out guidance. It's not all clear yet to everyone. So what I would suggest is both the owner of that business and the employees reach out to their local health department, which will in turn work with us, and maybe we could give them some guidance. Because I know I don't know this particular situation, so I can't comment on it. But I think what we want to do is reach out for help help the workers and make sure that someone actually local health department can help contact trace that and maybe get some testing to those folks and help the business actually handle that what potentially could be a little bit of an outbreak, um, not knowing the situation myself. But I think we have to offer help. So reach out to your local health department and if that's not satisfactory, um, please reach out to the state health department. And I, I would say also, Ben, that you know, if someone finds themselves in, in a position that they feel is unsafe because of this, because of COVID-19, uh, you know, obviously they should talk to the employer, uh, but they also have the option, uh, if that does not bring any kind of good results, uh, to go to the local health department. Uh, and and they, they can go and they can do that anonymously as well. So uh, that's not the ideal. Uh, what we hope is that every, you know, small business many times is like families and, and they treat each other like family and that's what we would hope would happen. Uh, but clearly something has to be done. The facts that you described are very, 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 very concerning and the, the employee certainly uh, has a right to be concerned. Thank you very much. That, that that the rules were written with the purpose of also empowering the employee. So there, there are requirements that the business do. So the, the employee can wear a mask, the employee can wash hands, uh, the employee can distance themselves for other, for other employees. If the employer uh, does not fulfill the obligation to, to, to clean uh, the common spaces, or to provide for this environment, uh, then, then the recommendation, talk to that employer, and if the employer won't do it, then as the governor mentioned, you're, you can go to the health department, or you can, con you can contact um, uh, the state health department if the local health department uh, it does not follow up. But, but we found that's worked very well at holding people accountable throughout uh, the experience we've had over the last six weeks or so. And while there's not a, a requirement, it's, it's best practices, but while it's not a requirement that someone who, who's a customer uh, who goes into a retail store wear a mask, um, there is a requirement uh, that people in the, in the companies wear that mask to protect each other. ABC 6 News, uh, can you talk a little bit more about what will the education cuts look like and what solutions you might be offering to schools whose students are, have suffered so much during this pandemic? Uh, yeah, our, the budget director, uh, Kim, will be making, um, will be available to the press corps tomorrow uh, to give really, really details. Uh, what we have done is outlined uh, what I read to you was the big, broad numbers. Uh, that represents uh, a, about a 3.7% cut uh, in education funding, uh, primary and secondary, over this past year. Uh, so it certainly will be significant in the next two months in the payments that, that go to the schools. Um, she will be outlining that, uh, the formula that every school obviously will be different. Um, I have expressed here at these press conferences, uh, concern about students who are in, uh, schools, uh, 
that do not have the revenue, um, poor schools, poor children. Uh, and so that certainly is taken into consideration uh, when we put that, put that formula together. Uh, so uh, she'll have more details on that, on that tomorrow. Hello, Governor. This is Shane Stegmiller with Hannah News Service. Uh, in the last budget, you included a lot of extra money for schools uh, aimed at helping wraparound services and that. How is what you're announcing today going to affect that? Are those funds going to be slashed as well? Those, those funds are not slashed. Uh, obviously, money is fungible, so when you take money away from a school, it, it does, or, or to give that school less money, it obviously has has some impact. And what we're really trying to do, we look kind of, we don't have a crystal ball. We can't predict where this economy is going. Uh, you know, we want to be optimistic, uh, and I am optimistic, but we also have to be cautious. And, and so what we wanted to do um, is to try to put the schools in a situation so as they begin in July, they begin the next year, uh, that the cuts that we would have to make beyond this would, would be minimal. Now, we don't know if that's going to be true or not. Uh, as John pointed out, uh, the challenge is that when you start cutting budgets, and other governors have found this and legislatures have found this, um, you know, there's some big items in the budget. Medicaid is certainly one. Um, higher education is one. K-12 through uh, is, is another. And so when you have to make these cuts, it is very difficult, frankly, to, to exempt out any, any of those uh, because they're very significant parts, parts of the budget. Hi, Governor. This is Molly Martinez with Spectrum News. In that same vein, could you explain the rationale behind such a deep cut to Medicaid during a pandemic? And also, prisons make up 7.7 percent of the budget. Why no cuts to them? Prisons are made up, uh, the budget of prisons are made up primarily of people. Uh, while we are seeing a some reduction in the number of people in prisons, um, the virus uh, has made it, uh, some of the staffing issues, more difficult. Uh, my guess is, uh, and Director Mernix can talk about this, is that prisons uh, probably have additional overtime that they are paying. Uh, so when you look at prisons and you, you just decide, how are you going to make those cuts, it's very difficult to, to find the money in the prisons. Uh, I think we all have a long-term goal of seeing the, the numbers come down, uh, but we also have an obligation to protect the public. Uh, and so I'm not going to make any, any dramatic, uh, radical uh, changes in, in our prisons um, beyond what you know, the legislature has, has, has already done. So they're really, <clears throat> you look to find the money, they're not really much of an opportunity in the prisons uh, to cut to cut that that money. It's all in staffing. It's on direct contact with with prisoners, and you need so many people, uh, you know, to do that for them to be safe. And, and so that's why it's difficult. Um, Director Mernix will, will go into some of the details about where we think uh, we can find the funding, where we will find the funding uh, in re in regard to Medicaid. Uh, we do not intend to reduce essential uh, services uh, to, to people uh, who, who have been hurt by this pandemic, uh, people who are drawing Medicaid. Uh, so it's a big budget, and uh, you know, we're confident that we can find that and will find that uh, $200 million out of there. Jack Windsor, WMFD-TV, Mansfield. My question is for the Lieutenant Governor. Lieutenant Governor, there's a growing belief that county officials, particularly health department directors, have power to interpret and implement orders we're now under, uh, similar to the Governor's uh, latitude regarding federal guidelines. And a few counties have already started to step out. Several others are in discussions and expressing beliefs that they have the power to determine what businesses are essential and when to restore civil liberties. Sir, do these counties and county departments of health have the authority and latitude? 
further, will this administration be heavy-handed or helpful as counties decide to go their own way? Well, I, I can tell you that the administration's always had the opinion that the local government officials are our partners uh, and that we want to work with them. Local governments have different opinions, just like average citizens. Uh, they have opinions that some want us to go faster, some want us to go slower. I've been on phone calls with local government officials who b gave me both of those pieces of advice today. Uh, but the governor has spelled out clearly that we have a pathway that we want to do to take the state through this together. Uh, and uh, we rely on our local officials to enforce uh, the rules in the executive order, which they have, have the obligation to do. Uh, and we're working uh, as swiftly as we can to provide that balance of protecting people's health, which we want to do, uh, but also opening up aspects of the economy and rolling back, uh, rolling back uh, some of the, the uh, restrictions that have been in place. But our, our whole plan, I want to be clear about what's happening in Ohio. We were the first ones in, in this, and we're at the forefront of coming out. We may not be the first, but we are on the front end of doing that, and the very nature of doing that requires us to trust people, to rely on the fact that they will use their freedom, uh, as, as you defined it, with personal responsibility so that we can open up aspects of the economy without exacerbating the spread and infringing on the, the health and, and good, and good uh, standing of, of our community. So it's the balance that we're trying to work through. We understand some want to go slower, some want to go faster, but I believe what we have uh, is very effective at, at threading the needle on that, and more things are happening all the time, as the governor's talked about, throughout the month of May. We're going to continue to, to loosen restrictions and trust people more and more every day. Let me just add one thing to that, uh, Jack. Um, we're moving, certainly moving away as we open Ohio up uh, from the distinction of essential and non-essential. So that was in the, in the previous orders. Uh, we're really moving away from that as we work through our way and, and open things up. Governor Tom Gallagher, Gongwar News Service. Uh, Getting back to wraparound services, should districts expect that there will be a separate pool of money for wraparound services in the next budget? Well, we haven't done the next budget, uh, but we are committed to wraparound services. Uh, wraparound services are even more essential uh, today than they were before. Uh, these have been met uh, with, I think, uh, welcome arms, uh, so to speak, and people have taken this money and have used it for very, very important things. Uh, mental health services, for example. Uh, so, you know, it, this would not be the time, um, you know, I made a commitment uh, that we would continue funding on wraparound services, uh, and we're going to do everything that we can to continue that commitment because we know some of the schools, many of the schools have relied upon that, have entered into long-term long contracts uh, or contracts that go beyond the next, next several months. And so we're going to uh, continue the funding on wraparound services. Hello, this is Jesse Melmert with The Inquirer. Uh, you said that you're not interested in touching the rainy day fund over the next two months. What, under what circumstances or criteria do you have for dipping into that fund? Kind of what are you looking for? Well, we know we're going to have to dip into it. I mean, it would be a miracle if we didn't have to dip into it. So we're planning on dipping into it. Uh, what we wanted to try to do uh, is get some cuts now, make tough decisions now, uh, the nature of, of, of budgets is that the longer you wait to make decisions, the tougher it is to make them. And so if you make them earlier, then it's not as, as difficult as you, as you move forward. Um, so uh, we know in this coming year that starts in July, you know, we're going to have to dip into the rainy day fund. 
Uh, there, there's just no way, based on projections, that we're going to be able to avoid that. Uh, it's also possible that we will need some of that rainy day fund in the next year after that. And so the whole goal is to try to, you know, the, the, what the legislature in its wisdom and Governor Kasich in his wisdom did is provide a rainy day fund. Uh, and that one of the main goals of a rainy day fund is so that you kind of level out services so you don't have such a huge drop in, in those services. You spread that money over the time, <coughs> excuse me, so that schools, for example, uh, just one example, but you try to avoid the huge dips uh, that schools will have. Now, I understand next two months are going to be a dip, uh, but you, you try to avoid kind of the roller coaster and trying to even things out, and you spread that money out over, over a period of time, and that's what we intend to do. I mean, we could have started taking from it now. Uh, it just made sense to try to get these cuts. The more prudent, the more conservative uh, attitude, it seemed to me, was to, to make some of these cuts now uh, and take it out of this next, next two months and then take that rainy day fund and spread over the next year and then maybe even some of that money into the, into the year after that. This is Laura from Cleveland.com. Um, did the CARES Act stem? Can you talk about the CARES Act and how that impacted budget cuts? And also, did you do any payment transfers to avoid cuts? The CARES Act um, and, and the schools, I think, know, know their numbers. But the, the CARES Act uh, is money for school. Part of that money goes to schools. Uh, and that is going to be a help uh, to the schools as they, as they deal with the coronavirus, uh, as they deal with this, this reduction. Uh, the CARES Act money uh, will be pulled down by the schools over the next year or so. Uh, and so that will be of help to every school in, in, the, in the state. Some schools, uh, poor schools, for example, will get more assistance and it will be more of help. But every school, if you look at the numbers, every school does get something uh, from the CARES Act. And I, I think I missed the last part of the question. I apologize. And for, um, yeah, payment transfers. Payment transfers? Uh, what a, I'm sorry, what about payment transfers? I'm sorry. How, were there any made and how did it, you know, affect the cuts? Did it help stem some of the cuts that needed to be made? Well, the, the, you know, one of the ways, as you know, it, you, that you can obtain some money uh, in one budget is to kind of push things back into the next budget. Uh, we have tried to avoid that. Uh, that's kind of a one-time deal that you can do. We tried to push those back and not draw that money down, and that's basically almost like a savings account, I suppose. We decided not to do that. Uh, and we just tried to make these tough decisions right up front. Just face them, go after them, uh, do what we have to do, uh, you know, however unpleasant that is. And we felt that that was better for, for uh, schools and better for everyone in, in the long run. But, but Kim Mernix tomorrow can give you the exact details in regard to that. In Ohio Capital Journal. Uh, yesterday, you started to outline how testing was going to be done through the coming months. Um, we're reopening the economy. Uh, there's an internal White House memo that uh, said that, I guess it was a draft, but it said that uh, deaths could be 3,000 a day in July. As we're doing this, if I'm thinking about an employee thinking about going back to work or an employer thinking about bringing my people back to work, where will we be able to get tested, and how will these tests be paid for? Is that part of the plan yet? I'm going to let Dr. Acton take part of that. I'll start, though. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, I, I think anyone who watched the news last night, uh, this morning, uh, would be struck uh, by the lead stories, which is uh, two different reports. One was a White House report or projection. Um, the other one was uh, out of Washington, uh, which both indicated a, a significant increase in the number of deaths. Um, you know, I, 
Uh, I stated last night in an interview that certainly is, is concerning. Uh, anybody should be concerned about that. Um, again, I have not dug down into the basis of those decisions, what facts uh, they thought had changed or what assumptions maybe that were changing, and we're taking, we're taking a look at that. But it does, I think, emphasize the importance of testing um, and for us to move very quickly on testing. We have the ability today. We have the contract. We are starting to stand up um, uh, more people who are going to do the tracing. So as we open up, having tracing, having testing uh, is very, uh, very, very significant. And we'll let Dr. Acton take, take the rest of that. Dr. Acton. Thank you, Governor. Um, thank you. So that is the um, probably the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, um, the Washington State University uh, modeling numbers, uh, going back to modeling, if we all remember that, um, that the White House has been using. And again, a lot of this has to do with the fact that modeling is very confusing to the general public. Sure, where we were last, but again, with that modeling that came out of the White House, it was predicting um, that we would have um, 60,000 deaths in this country by August, and now we know we have them here in May. So, please, we always have to look at these things as the fact that we're all learning about this experience at the same time. It's an unprecedented thing. The science is there largely to help us make better decisions and kind of see trends. You know, I'm sure if you talk to the researchers like Dr. Chris Murray, they, they'd have a lot of caveats and explanations. But we do know that as we're opening up, there will be more cases and there will be more deaths. And a lot of it is very dependent on how well we can learn to live with this virus, control the outbreaks when they occur, and try to minimize the infection starting to spread through the community. Um, and a lot of that, again, our ability to catch a case early is based on testing, so back to your testing question. And testing is just not enough yet. The testing we're still looking at doing with our tiers, which are on our website, are still for prioritized groups, the most sick, the hospitalized, at-risk populations with pre-existing health conditions, congregate settings of all sorts that are higher risk. There is, we are not doing specifically testing in businesses at this point. However, if the local health department comes across a cluster outbreak, they may choose to use some of their limited testing to figure out, because a business in a, a way in the future here, like the meatpacking industry we have seen, will become a congregate setting. And so there will be some judgment, but it's not widespread. And I think this is a very important point. There's a lot of other news about the misuse of antibody testing, much of it that wasn't really vetted very well and is being marketed to businesses. So I think I would give businesses a heads up, be careful, maybe talk to your health department, um, about that, I think there's a lot being marketed right now as a business solution that really hasn't been studied. Um, so that's just a caveat that I'd like to put out there now. People where they can get tested and how they'll be paid for. Right now, we do tell people when you talk to your physician, a physician has to do an order. And when a physician or a hospital decide you need a test, you're told how to get it. So that exists, and there are many payment mechanisms um, from insurance to much of the state testing that we do, which is actually free of charge. So um, there's a wide variety, as in all of healthcare, about how testing is paid for. Thank you. Hi, Governor Andy Chow with Ohio Public Radio and Television, State House News Bureau. Uh, in 
in regards to the, the budget cuts, what kind of uh, involvement does the legislature have to have with that? Do they need to approve those cuts? And have you given any thought to something like an MBR, a mid-biennium review, to take a look at the budget issues further? Uh, we consulted with the legislature, uh, got input uh, from, from leadership, uh, but these are basically, uh, basically our decisions. But, you know, everything that we do um, in regard to the budget, uh, you know, we work with members of the state legislature. So as far as a review, uh, we're going to have, you know, this is a continuous process. Uh, we're in a very uh, unusual extremely unusual time uh, and there is no one uh, national state anyplace else that can really uh, give you uh, real reliable predictions because we don't know where this economy is going and we are in a, obviously an international economy as well as a national economy so um, it, it, my point I guess is that this budget uh, is going to have to be monitored you know, very, very closely, and we're going to do that with the legislature. So we're going to go through constant reviews as we look at the revenues that, that are coming in. Hi, Governor. Jim Otte from WHIO-TV. Thanks for doing this. I want to ask what guidance you are going to be providing to local school districts, given this cut look a couple of months down the road. Are you currently thinking that they're going to return to the physical classroom in the fall? The fall seems like a long way off, but it's really just around the corner. And, and if so, is this the first cut? Will there be two or three more down the road? What should they be thinking? You know, we don't want any more cuts. Uh, we certainly cannot guarantee that. Uh, we don't know exactly where we're going. We wanted to take this one uh, because we felt that that would give us a better chance of having more stability as we go through this next year. Uh, but no one can guarantee that. Uh, we certainly hope that. Uh, as far as whether they're going back into the classroom, I think everyone would like to see schools back in session in August uh, or whenever, whatever date they have when they're going back in. Um, and we're just going to have to see where we are. I, I do know that uh, schools have been working on different uh, options. Uh, I, I know that the State Department of Education has a working group uh, working with schools uh, to look at different options. Uh, in discussions I've held w had with superintendents, they are all, and, and principals and teachers, they are all looking at different ways, you know, how could they exist in, in a world where coronavirus is still very much here. How do they get the social distancing? Very difficult, uh, you know, but some have come up with plans, um, just options. They're coming up with many options. One, one option I think we've discussed here before uh, is kind of a two-day, two-day uh, where you spread the students out more, uh, which means that you're really having students there for two days, other students there for two days, but you're doing the distance learning uh, during the during the entire period of time, so it's kind of a kind of a hybrid system. I'm not saying that's where we end up, uh, but each school is kind of trying to figure out the configuration of their school building, uh, their students, how many of the students are picked up in school buses, all these different things schools are schools are looking at. Uh, so you know we have to see where we are with the with the virus, but my recommendation to schools is, you know, look at different options come up with what is unique to you um, and wh where you need to have unique flexibility, uh, come up with different different options and continue to work with the State Department of Education on that. Hello, Governor. It's uh, Andrew Welsh Huggins with the Associated Press. Um, Governor, we're continuing to see coronavi coronavirus cases climb in adult and juvenile prisons in Ohio. We're obviously familiar with what's going on in uh, state prisons, but we've now got an outbreak at a DYS facility in suburban Cleveland. Franklin County Juvenile Detention Center has an outbreak. Uh, in Morrow County, jail officials say at least 50 detainees being held by ICE have tested positive. Uh, my question is, 
should more be done to address outbreaks in all correctional facilities, if only because uh, we're already concerned about flare-ups as we reopen, and these could contribute to that um, uh, this summer. What is of grave concern to me, uh, I know it is to the director, uh, we have many people who are working on this uh, e every single day. Uh, I've asked um, uh, Governor Strickland, uh, who has had experience not only as a governor, uh, but experience in working in the prisons, um, someone who knows a lot about mental health issues. Um, he has been on a lot of calls uh, that we ha we've had over the last several weeks, and I appreciate uh, the governor uh, being willing to do that. But we've called in uh, Dr. Uh, Reggie Wilkinson, who, who used to head up our prisons, uh, Tom Stickrath. Uh, we've had uh, medical professionals from uh, the Ohio State University. So we pulled in uh, a lot of different people uh, in, in working groups in regard to our prisons. Um, but it, is a, it certainly is of grave concern. It is the nature Tragically, it is the nature of congregate living. Um, you know, a big percentage of our prisoners do not live in cells. That might be the concept if no one's ever, people have not been in a prison, but uh, certainly the, the ones who are in cells are usually the, 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 the most high risk, most dangerous, uh, but most everybody else, about 60%, live in a congregate setting, uh, almost like you would envision dorms. Um, and, and the nature of that is that it spreads very, very quickly. Uh, the director uh, was on the screen uh, last week and was talking about, you know, the different things that she has been doing. Uh, but it is uh, uh, certainly of grave concern. Um, uh, you know, I ask the qu same question every day. Are we doing everything that we can? Uh, and we're, we're trying to come up with, with different things. But that congregate setting, that people being that close to each other uh, causes a great, great deal of spread. Uh, as you know, we went into, and the director talked about this the other day, uh, in the prisons where uh, we really had a great outbreak, uh, we've gone in uh, and tested everybody. We've learned, we've learned a lot from that. Uh, one of the things that uh, the medical professionals have told us as a result of what they found is that it is probably not prudent to test everybody. Uh, but there are other things that, you know, the, the testing of the guards are, 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 are important. Uh, we've accelerated that. We're going to continue to, to accelerate that. And it is of concern not just to the, for the tragedy within the prison, uh, but obviously out into the different communities where people who work in the prisons end up going back out. Dr. Acton, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. but yeah, That's... We are aware of those outbreaks, and I know that the local health departments and the hospitals are working alongside the, the juvenile facilities. So, and the director, um, Director Geese, is very much on that as well. So, yeah, it's hard. Congregate settings, as the governor said, um, present so much for the staff. And again, I think we, the staff and everyone, deserve a little extra appreciation and attention to because they go to work and, and they keep doing the work knowing that it's a tougher situation just like our healthcare workers. Um, but we are doing everything we can. Um, and I talked to my state fellow uh, state health directors and we're seeing this everywhere. Yeah. Thank you. Adrian Robbins, NBC4, and my question's for the governor. Um, the shutdown has obviously had huge effects on businesses and now the state as well. How much did seeing these revenue numbers go into your decision to reopen Ohio now? And is it fair to say that the state almost needs this reopening to go as smoothly as these businesses do? I, I missed the last part, I'm sorry. Say that again, the last part. Does the state need this reopening to happen smoothly and quickly almost as much as the businesses do? Uh, this was really not a factor in, in, in making the decision, um, not the revenue funding. Um, it, 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 what 
was part of the decision uh, is we know the, the, the social cost, we know the medical cost, the health cost of a huge downturn. Uh, and Dr. Acton has, has talked about that. Lieutenant Governor has, has talked about that. So there's a big cost, not just economically, uh, to a downturn in the economy, but you, you find that depression goes up, you find that domestic violence historically goes up. There's a lot of bad things that occur during a downturn in the economy. And, and we know that we cannot uh, sustain that downturn for, forever, and we've got to start moving forward. So all those factors, things factor in into the decision that you've got to start moving. Uh, but I uh, no, not not the specific numbers that I was seeing come in did not really impact a decision to, you know, open up. Uh, you know, we're not opening up to increase state revenues, although we do know that the revenue uh, that comes in or does not come in directly impacts schools. It directly impacts our ability to help people with mental health problems. Uh, and so that's not it's not irrelevant. It certainly is. It certainly is important. No. Thank you. Add to that, um, we've talked to so many different experts as this has gone on, and I've looked at a lot of the health economics data. You know, economics being like a field unto itself, even different than looking at at business data, and. And, and what they have shown so far, some of the best experts in the world, is how we do this and doing it well really matters. And so that's, that's the part where all the health safety that businesses are taking, and honestly, like our best chance of being able to maximize that is about our using things like this and doing all the steps right. And, and I, I really want Ohioans to understand this because it is the virus our economy was already being disrupted and there's already data showing that before there ever was an order. Because this is a global pandemic that's having global effects on supply chains and people are out sick for a week at a time and then can't work. And so it's bigger than all of us here, but the way we can do it the best in Ohio is to really respect the virus and do it well, respect the workers when we go in by wearing this mask gives us our best chance of maximizing it for all of us. Thank, Thank you. you. Kevin Landers, WBNS 10 TV. My question is for the governor. Uh, real quickly, governor, when do these cuts take effect? Um, and what happens after the two months? And also, what, what was the biggest pushback that you got when you presented these cuts? Did people lobby for deeper cuts? Thank you. Well, they take effect immediately. Um, you know, we're going to obviously go from right now putting these cuts into effect and starting to look at, at the budget that begins in July. So those are discussions that we're going to move immediately to because it's going to really be, be right upon us. Um, uh, you know, we had discussions with, with the legislature. Look, I mean, no one wants to see cuts to education. Uh, you know, we're concerned about you know, the impact of, of local schools. Um, so I don't think anybody's happy about anything, uh, but it is what it is. And, uh, you know, we, we, we have to do what we have to, we simply have to do what we have to do. You feel like you cut enough? Well, I think it's the right amount. Um, you know, I think, I think it's the right amount. Obviously we think it's the right amount. It's what we came, what we came up with, but, um, uh, you, you know, you, you try to do it so that you can set yourself up uh, so that you don't have you know, the, the roller coaster next year. Um, I mean, as, as the lieutenant governor pointed out, the vast, vast majority of the money in the state's budget goes out. It, it does not, it's not here to run, you know, the, the different agencies or different departments. It's, it goes out into the communities. You know, a lot of it goes out in the schools. A lot of it goes out for social services that goes out and are administered locally. So trying to give those local communities uh, some stability and some assurance, uh, we felt that these deeper cuts now would enable us to have a better chance of having the stability as we go through this this next year without any guarantees we can't guarantee anything but we felt that taking that now and, and, and doing that 
however unpleasant it was uh, and is, uh, it was the right thing to do and the responsible thing to do. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Randy Ludlow with the Columbus Dispatch. Uh, disregarding the next couple of months, because many agencies can deal with cuts for a couple of months, uh, but looking at next school year and given how bad the financial forecast looks, uh, do you envision heavy reductions to schools continuing? Uh, in the primary, a near record number of school levies failed. Uh, the locals may see this as fo foistering uh, more of the funding burden on local taxpayers, requiring more tax levies. Uh, do you have concern about that? Well, as far as your latter comment, of course. Um, you know, I certainly have concern about that. I have concern about uh, every school district in, in the state of Ohio. Um, so, yeah, we, we have concern. Uh, do we hope to avoid uh, additional cuts? But, again, not having the crystal ball, we don't, we don't know that. Um, the, the reality, and, and Randy, you've been around uh, a little while and covering the state house and uh, legislators and uh, governors, but, uh, you know, it, when you look at the budget and you look at places to cut, uh, there aren't too many places where you get the real significant money. Uh, I mean, we have an obligation with state agencies uh, to, to go in and, and, and do the cuts and do those things. Uh, but that does not produce the money that you, you need uh, because it's such a small percentage of the budget. And so when you look at the big ticket items today, it's Medicaid, uh, it's, it's, it certainly is education, it's some of our social services, um, and that's why these these decisions, uh, whoever the governor is, uh, are never are never particularly easy, and it's not particularly easy for members of the legislature either. The local government funds in the next budget year. You know, Randy, what we've been able to do, uh, what we were able to do in the first year, uh, along with the state legislature, is to give local governments some help by picking up uh, some of the cost. Uh, for example, the Indigent Defense Fund, uh, that really sh historically it should have been a state obligation, uh, and the locals have ended up paying most of it. Uh, we were able to get money back to the counties uh, by picking up a bit much more significant amount of that. Uh, another area that's certainly near and dear to my heart is children's services. Um, you know, we do not want to be in a position, uh, uh, the state, state does not pay that much for local children's services anyway. We upped that dramatically in this last year of the budget. Uh, we would hope to be able to preserve that. Um, and not and foster that on to the, the local government and, and, and hurt uh, the services that we're providing these kids. But all of these are tough decisions, and we're going to have to see where, exactly where we are as we move forward. Hello, Governor. Jim Province with the Toledo Blade. Um, your H2 Ohio program to clean up all, uh, Lake Erie um, counts not only on funding or appropriations in the current budget th these two years, but it was also relying on budget surpluses in future years, uh, surpluses that I assume were, you're probably not too confident are going to show up now. Um, was H2 Ohio one of the programs cut under, the, under your plans? Well, Jim, uh Kim Mernix will give all the details, but I, I know that we made a decision to cut off uh, applications uh, at some point from farmers when in a regular year we probably would have been able to extend those applications. And, and just to remind everyone, uh, you know, this is the program to, to uh, clean up Lake Erie, uh, to deal with the algae bloom. Uh, we're still very much committed to that program. Uh, this is something in the long term. So we want to keep that program going. Uh, we want to keep it going as robust as, as, as we can. Um, but again, everything is subject to, uh, uh, you know, where this, where this economy is going. So um, it's still a priority, and, and we're going to do, do the best that we can. But what we, what we did do is when normally we would have extended it 
and took taken some more applications in and got some more farmers in at some point when it filled we had to we had to we just shut it down because we were afraid that we would not have the money to to extend it beyond um, the, those that deadline and those applications thank you good afternoon governor it's Laura Bischoff Dayton Daily News I'm last question for the day um, I was wondering if you could provide some details on when you're going to roll out the um, information on bars and restaurants reopening, and then also uh, you mentioned that you've uh, you've asked you're working with Governor Taft and Governor Celeste and Governor Strickland. I'm wondering if you have called on Governor Kasich for any assistance. Yes, I have, and I, I talked to him uh, a, a lot about the uh, the economy um, and. You know how we move Ohio back, and um, we're, we're not uh, letting the governor off. Uh, you know, not without some uh, consultation. So, I, look, I have found that in these uh, former governors, uh, there is a great deal of wisdom, uh, a great deal of knowledge, and a great deal of experience. And I fully intend to continue to uh, utilize all four of them uh, as 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 we move forward. Uh, as far as uh, the other question, uh, I will be receiving uh, and reviewing uh, the next day um, reports from the business working groups that we put together uh, to, to look at daycare, uh, to, to look at um, restaurants and bars, uh, and to the other group that was there has been working on, on hair um, and uh, so I will be reviewing these and uh, we hope on Thursday uh, to have some announcements uh, about that uh, so we will not be here uh, tomorrow uh, legislature is in session those of you who watch uh, the Ohio channel have the opportunity to watch the, the state legislature it's our goal to be back here on Thursday uh, and we hope to have, uh, Laura, some announcements in regard to uh, those, those issues then. Uh, so we look forward to seeing everyone, uh, barring something unforeseen when we need to come back here tomorrow. We probably will not be here tomorrow. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all on Thursday. Thank you very much.